May a few of you are used to singing it, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So, everyone, welcome to this meetup. I'm John Ekman. I'm the founder of this uh, commercialista company. Uh, I'm not going to do so much talking. I'm pretty good at talking, so I'm going to try to <laughs> keep quiet today. We we got another talkative guy here today called Craig Sullivan from the from Scotland. He, he happens to be residing in London, but uh, he's he's a Scotsman by heart. So um, and I usually introduce uh, Craig as one of the people in the world that probably done does has done more 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 A/B tests than anyone. More fuck ups. More fuck ups. Yeah. <laughs> than yeah. Anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Comes with the territory. So we're we we're, we're doing um we have an education called Conversion Manager which runs for nine occasions with uh, basically taking you from knowing nothing about A-B testing to being a pro at the end. <laughs> uh, and Craig's going to uh, have, a, have a talk there tomorrow on, on conversion tools. And uh, when you're in town, we figured let's do a meetup. So that's what we did. And you're all here. Maybe some more people will come by. Um, and so we're going to do a presentation. I uh, We're not going to be here for hours listening to the presentation. So our idea is that grab the opportunity to ask questions, uh, you know, hit the Craig with your own questions, you know, why did we put that stupid little button here and why didn't we move that shit over here and whatever it is. So with with all that I'll just hand it over to you Craig. Welcome. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been coming to Stockholm for quite a few years now. I love the city, I love the place, I love the the, the, the fantastic so a uh, group of digital people who are doing amazing stuff here and a lot of the startups as well and um, uh, I've been enjoying presenting a lot on, on tools as John says and certainly a couple of my recent presentations in Stockholm have been about that um, but Simon and, um, and John asked me to present a completely different type of presentation because most of the presentations you'll have seen for the last couple of years are how fucking great my company is and how good my work is and here's my fantastic test result. I'm not going to tell you any of that stuff today. I'm going to tell you about all the fuck ups I've made with A-B testing, all the mistakes, all the things that went wrong. But then I'm turning that around into a set of instructions really to help you avoid making quite so many mistakes as I have. And I, you know, I've now done about 40, I've put over 40 million visitors through split tests. So there has been plenty of time to make all of these mistakes. So the good reason about talking about these is it isn't putting a positive slant on it. It's saying these are the things that have gone wrong for me, and these are the things that I really want you to uh, avoid. I've put 13 in the deck today, but I actually have about 38 of these, so I'm still working on them. You guys are the first to see any of this material. I'll be developing it further and doing some of it as video, but you get the first taste of the, the, the top stuff I've learned from the last, how many years is it? Eight years of AB and split testing. So I hope it's useful. Please put your hand up at any time. It isn't like a big formal presentation. Just stop me and ask questions. And then at the end, if you want to ask more stuff or you want to maybe go and have a look at a particular site or a test that you're running, then we can dive into that too. But either way, just grab me if you've got any questions or, uh, or afterwards or next week. It doesn't really matter. So what am I going to be talking about today? These are the major fuck-ups. These are the things that have gone wrong. And so, although I've got about 38 things to talk about, these are the 13 that I feel are going to be most vital for you to be looking at next year when you're actually doing some testing. A little bit of background on me. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I, I started out doing UX and analytics work for the John Lewis Partnership, a large retail outfit in the UK, back in 1999. And I've been experimenting with user-centered design, agile and lean techniques, but really bringing together sort of a bit like a bar stool, you know, several legs here. So analytics, UX, tools and customer insight, and then development methodology. So really turning things from fucking guessing everything or just doing what the boss says into a kind of data-driven methodology for improving sites. Um, and uh, basically I was working for a company called Belron, who you will know locally as Carglass here in Sweden. They're all around the world, very, very big company. And for the last year, I've been doing consulting work, um, which, which has been very interesting. I've had to 
go back and, and do a lot of hands-on stuff that uh, maybe I was out of practice on. So this has been really good. It feels like I've been to the Google Analytics gym this year and I am totally pumped. Um, so number one in the list, what is one of the biggest problems that hits people here on A-B testing? That's right, you're doing it in the wrong place. Okay, it's great, you can put lots of effort into it, but all you're creating is friction and noise and you're not actually achieving any outcome and you're not going anywhere at all. Um, and believe me, there are a lot of people in this, um, in this bracket. So let's think about if you're doing it in the wrong place, what are the four key areas that a CRO expert always looks at? Well, the first thing that you look to model is your inbound attrition. You know, you've got all these people entering in, a bit like a department store, they're coming in through various entrances, and then some of them turn around and leave, you know, and some of them make it deeper into the store, some of it actually make it to pick up an item off the rail, some of them make it to the till, and some of them actually pay. But that initial attrition, the loss of people as they come into the site, and you know you can refer to it as bounce rate or decrease in engagement as people go through various steps. But that's one of the, the starting places that I always look. Second place that I look is key conversion points. So where there's a great big fucking button or some action that's natural for them to take, then you know this could be the product page, the basket page, you know the page where you're asked to register or log in. These are all kind of key conversion points where you might or you might not, depending on how good, uh, how persuasive and how well designed they are from a UX point of view. Then the third area is processes and steps. So if you've got forms, a lead generation form, a registration form, uh, the checkout process, forms require special consideration and they're also one of the places where I make most of the money for the companies that I'm working for. And then there's kind of the middle bit of the site, so not the entry point and not the completion point, but that kind of bit in the middle, you know, where you're trying to get them to search or look at categories and eventually get to a product page. And I'm using e-commerce terms here, but a lot of this stuff applies equally well to content sites, it's just some of the names are going to be different. So if you're not looking in these places for where your major kind of dropouts might be, then that's going to be the first problem. What can help you here? Well, one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give you from this year is use the flow reports in Google Analytics. If you really, really want to see how people are flowing in through a landing page and then how many you lose step by step, I showed Google their data for their AdWords website this year and all their data was wrong in Google Analytics, but the flow report showed me what was really happening and that was in Google's AdWords site, 99.1% of all visitors bounce out on the first page. It's terrible. It's the highest bounce rate I've ever seen. But these visitor flow reports, especially where you look at one type of traffic or one landing page, one group of customers, can be very useful for you to visually see. They also look really good if you put them into a PowerPoint slide because they're a nice visual way of explaining where your dropout's happening. And when you're looking at these key conversion points, product, basket page, and registration, you're, you're really interested in the loss rates. How many people are making it to that step and how many people are making it onto the next step? There's also a lot of stuff about interactions on in the page. And I think the, the days of you thinking your website is page A, page B, and page C is all wrong. I'll come to this later. It's a really important point. Um, and when you're, when you're looking at processes and steps, quite a lot of the configurations I've looked at this year, they've been broken. The site's set up wrongly, the funnel in Google Analytics isn't showing the right data, but there are ways uh, that you can make your own funnels here. And uh, I'll mention this later on. There are ways that you can manually get the data. So even if you find a completely broken Google Analytics setup, you can still get useful data from it if you make your own reports. And for this idea of people getting deeper into the site and having various layers of engagement, then one thing that's really useful is if you try and make your own model. So a bit like when you think, if you're standing in a department store and you're watching people come in the store, you can see the flow of visitors and where they're looking and which departments they're going to. Um, if you you can easily see where the flow is wrong or where there's a bottleneck. But how do you do that on a website? You need to create some sort of model because you can't physically see the traffic flowing. So you've got to try and find out exactly what's happening. 
So let's look at one way of doing this, one example I've used recently on a few sites. And here's the concept, it's really, really simple. What you've got is you've got people who, people who bounce out of the site and then people who engage in some sort of way with the content or the products and then there's an outcome that happens. You know, they, they, they add something to a wish list, they check out, there's some revenue generating opportunity. And, you know, pretty much every e commerce site will fit into this kind of model. So let me show you, this has just run out of battery. <laughs> let me show you. Let me show you an example. This is a, a shop for a hair salon site. So <coughs> when I created a very simple model, remember none of these reports are in Google Analytics. So I'm using a thing called unique page views, which is telling me how many unique visitors got this far. So how many came to the outer part of the site, uh, came into the site, but then bounced out? Okay, so I almost I throw that traffic away. I'll, uh, I'm interested in looking at how big it is, why they're bouncing out, but right now, for this model, I can say, okay, let's look at the next level. So then we're looking for people who do some kind of search, uh, product search, or they go to a category page. Then some people will make it as far as looking at the individual product page, maybe have some uh, interaction on there. Add to basket is the primary one here. And then they've got a view basket function, and then their checkout stage is all the way to completion. So when you create a ring diagram like th this, and, and this isn't shown to <coughs> the exact size, one of the first things that you'll see is you'll see where you are losing huge traffic in the ring. So in this particular page, page uh, 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 situation, the problem that we found was is that we were getting plenty of people to the product page, but none of them were adding to basket. And so that, that was a real help in designing tests to solve this problem because we could see visually where we are losing most people. So is this a checkout problem or is it a problem in getting people to actually add to basket? And this kind of ring model can really, really help you. Let me show you another example. So this is a ticket site in the UK that I looked at and you've got a slight difference here. You've got people who bounce out, but you've also got a huge amount of people who actually log in, who created their account. So for the purposes of this model, trying to look at new customer sort of buying their yearly rail ticket for the first time, I'm not really interested in them. And in this model, we looked at how many people were engaging with the content, who started the application process, who put in their kind of type of rail card, uploaded their photo and got all the way through the process. Again, we could see exactly where the major drop rate was. And it wasn't a content problem on site, it was a problem particularly around this photo upload. So we can see that really easily on the diagram. Another example, this is a charity site for guide dogs and it, it's similar to the other sites but it's not an e-commerce model. So again, there's a bounce on the outside of the site, then some people reading the content about what the uh, guide dogs association does. And then there's a donation pathway, something where it's saying, well, you can donate to this, or you can sponsor a puppy, or you can give us some money every month. And those pathways actually lead into them giving money. So the whole point of showing you these ring diagrams is that um, you don't need to create visual ones like this. You can create these kind of models in Excel just by pulling data out of Google Analytics. Make your own model. Because once you see, you know, we get 100,000 people uh, uh, uniques a week looking at the product page but we only get 50 people adding to basket well you know you can see the problem is shifting them from there to there it's not higher up it's not a problem with the search or category navigation in site it's actually a deeper problem it's a very good way of looking at it and also when you're inside one of these layers there are various things that you can do that will keep you in that layer so if you're looking at many different categories of goods and you will s stay inside the kind of category layer, but there may be some other micro interactions. So these are the macro interactions. You know, I'm, I'm looking at a product, I'm adding to basket, I'm viewing the basket, and then going to checkout. But there are also some micro interactions, like I add it to my wish list, I give you my email address for your newsletter, I send you a contact request, or I like you on Facebook. There are all these little micro-conversions, a lot of which you've got 
uh, available to happen on things like product pages, um, these aren't necessarily taking you deeper into the conversion funnel or making money, but they're still worth recording. So remember, the Ring model has both micro and macro in there. So a kind of summary of this stuff is, you really have to, there's not enough time to kind of cover this today about how to create these kind of models, but getting to know the flow and loss is a bit like being a plumber. If someone says, right, I've got a plumbing problem in my house, my water bills are $10,000 a month, what do I do? Well, the plumber has to figure out first, can I fix all the leaks simultaneously at once instantly for this customer? No. They have to go around the house and find all the leaks, find what tools and materials are going to be needed to fix each one, but the most important thing is how much water is being lost. And you start with the one that is losing the most water and, and it's the easiest to fix and then you move on to the others. Once you start to know these kind of steps where you're losing people and how much traffic you have, that also helps you make a thing called a money model. So every time that you're doing split testing, if you say, okay, a thousand people are going to see this page a month and 20% are going to convert to checkout, okay, this page, maybe you get 2,000 checkouts a month, but only 1,000 people are going to see this page. So when you run a split test on it, you're only going to influence those people. So you can then estimate the influence your test can bring. If you say, if we run a test on this page, we think we might get between 10 and 20% more checkouts. So you can then say, well, the rise in checkouts is going to be between um, 10 <laughs> and uh, 20 extra checkouts each month. <coughs> so you can then estimate how much money your test is going to bring. And I've been doing a, lo uh, a lot of this recently. When I've been putting together testing plans for people, I actually run the numbers and I, I make a guess, an estimate, about how much lift I'm going to get from running the test. And then I can actually sort all the work in money order. So we can put the things that are going to make the most money, the biggest leaks, at the top. And you ought to congratulate yourself if you ever make that kind of model, because it's the world's first fucking IT plan with a return on investment <laughs> attached to it, right? Um, and this doesn't happen very often. The first time I presented it to a board, they said exactly that. They said, this is amazing. It's the first time we've ever seen an IT plan that's got any idea of how much money this is going to make instead of exactly how much it's going to cost us. And that was really good for them. It was an eye-opener. Um, and I'll talk more about prioritizing later, because that's really important. And it's not just about money. Uh, you may not be driven by that kind of metric, but also there are other things to have a think about. The most important thing here is think like a store owner. If you are in charge of this huge department store, and somebody said to you, you know, what would you like to do? Well, I, I would like to refurbish this entire department store and do absolutely everything, and it's going to cost $200 million. Well, you're not going to get the money from it. They're going to say, well, when are we going to get our $200 million back and increase sales? So if you can't refurbish the entire store, where are the dirty bits? You know, where are the bad bits? Where are the floors that are underperforming? Which are the departments that you're going to invest in optimizing? And if you ask a department store owner this question, where would you invest if you know you hadn't spent a lot of money for a long time? They would say, I'm going to invest where there are people, footfall, where there are people walking around. So obviously, you know, this department up here that hardly anyone goes to, I'm not going to invest all my money there. But wherever there is traffic from customers, where the return is low, so we're, we're, we're actually selling less than we expect to be selling in, in that space inside the store, but also where there is an opportunity. If we know that the merchandising and the layout of that floor is really bad, then we know that by improving it, we'll increase sales quite a lot. So those are the three things that you look for in a department store, traffic, lower return than expected and opportunity. And it's exactly the same with the website. You cannot fix all of this stuff. All the stuff that you want to fix on your sites or your client sites, it's great. You, c you can fix them all, but which ones are you going to start with? Which ones are going to make the client delighted earlier and get them to keep giving you work? And that's the important thing. Number two, another common fuck up. A uh, lot of people get together, 
look at a page on the site and decide how they're going to redesign it and put stuff into test. And sometimes it can work if you're asking the right questions, but most of the time your inputs are all wrong. So, you know, these are common ones that take the place of rational decision making, ego, opinion, cherished notions. Oh, I saw that in an article the other day. Oh, that's cool. We should be doing this. Or look what our competitor is doing. We, uh, we've got to do something like that. Let's run a split test based around that. These are all wrong because you're guessing about what you think the problem is. And unless you have, you know, you may as well just get some dice out and just, and just roll them and decide your strategy that way because you're not getting the right inputs here. And if you don't get the right inputs, then these will take over. You know, the ego of the guy in charge of signing off all the work is going to take over unless you fill that vacuum with data and knowledge. So those aren't the inputs that you're looking for. These are the kind of inputs that you need to put into an A-B test. So the more of these that you've got, the more time you spend talking to people who do sales with customers or support in your call center, the more time you do usability testing or looking at your analytics or having voice the customer surveys on your website, the better the hypothesis, the better the test designs you will create because you're not creating them for your ego and your internal landscape, you're actually creating them to respond to a problem that customers have told you about is stopping them from giving you more money. It's a clue. It's a really, really good clue. Um, and you should follow this one. It, it will make you far more money than listening to your boss, that's for sure. So, um, what I would say here is when you are when you're trying to get all these inputs, you need multiple tools and sources of inputs. And I'm not going to go through all those tools. I'm covering it in the course tomorrow. But if you want to download one of my tool decks, you'll find an entire list of everything I think you should be using in there. Um, if you're not doing any usability testing, there's no excuse these days. You can pay for online usability testing, or you can recruit visitors who are coming to your site to do a test on there and get feedback. And these days, instead of doing tests in the lab, a lot of my clients are spending maybe £100 on doing some very quick tests. But I might do three or four user tests and, and change the product and keep rerunning the tests. And this costs me a tiny amount compared to you know, hiring a lab and getting people in and videoing it all. Actually, I don't really need all of that. So I can do this stuff. There, there isn't an option that says, oh, it's a bit too expensive. You won't do any usability testing. That way you will make yourself crap tests. That's what will happen to you. So if you think saving £100 on usability testing is a good idea, then please think again. It's not expensive. If you can get session replay tools, so Clicktail and Session Cam, uh, I've used both of these. Clicktail has got really good reporting, fantastic tool, a bit more expensive. Session Cam is really easy to get set up, you get recordings back straight away. But these are really vital because they give you kind of more visibility of what the users are struggling with. So if you are designing an AB test for a page on site, then put some session replay on the page and capture maybe two or three hundred people using that page and failing to get to the next step. So it gets depressing. All you're doing is watching videos of people who came into the store and walked straight out again. So it's really depressing. You're actually selecting all the bad stuff where everybody failed and then you're watching the videos of them filling out the form or interacting with the product page. You will find stuff <coughs> in the, those session replay tools that you won't get from anywhere else, which is why it's a really important tool to add. So that's one of my that's one of my secret tools that I use. And simple page analytics don't cut it anymore. So it used to be the old day of the internet back in, you know, the nineteen nineties, you would get a website that was page one, page two, page three. But now when you go to a page on your website, you have got all these widgets and dynamic and interactive content so they might change something to do with the product so they choose a different color they interact with photographs of the hotel or the product or whatever they're looking at so there may be five ten or fifteen things that people can interact with that's telling you something useful but this happens and they're still on the one page so it's not page a b c it's page a then interaction one, interaction two, interaction three, 
then page B. So it's really important if your analytics and your way of thinking is based around pages, then you really need to think about event tracking because this tells you what people are doing. They're not going from page A to page B, they're doing stuff inside the page and you've got to track it. And like I said, uh, get rid of ego, opinion and cherish notions. Fill these vacuums of bullshit with insights and data. And I like to always think of making a seat at the table for the users. You know, every time you have a meeting to discuss the product, is someone there representing them? No. Okay? So there's an empty chair at the table. Who's going to speak for them? Who's going to say what they want? Who's going to try and represent their needs in product design? So make sure that you give them a chair and a voice at every meeting. Very, very important. Any questions so far? Okay. Number three, another common AB test fuck up. And this has become so useful for me, particularly rescuing broken tests or tests that didn't go the way that I was expecting. If you haven't turned on or done the work to make sure that your analytics knows about what you're split testing, then what you're going to do is you're going to miss out on these things. You won't be able to investigate problems with tests. All you'll do is you'll say, it was God, it was some cosmic rays, or we have no fucking idea, it didn't work. Or maybe you'll think, well, actually it did work, and you'll be completely wrong. So either way, you've, you've gone off in the wrong direction here, and you've got no way of checking your data. So if you like investigating problems with tests, you need to have integration. If you want to segment your results, let's say you have a, a test that only does 5% better than the old one, but actually one group of customers inside that test did 90% better than the other groups, okay? The problem you're doing is you're looking at the average response across all the customers. If you were to find out which customers really loved and didn't love so much that A-B test, then you would be using segmentation. And if you don't integrate with your analytics, you're not going to get as good segmentation. If you have a split test where it's running like this, and this one's beating the other one, and it's going like this, and then suddenly it flips and they change places, or the test keeps moving around and it doesn't seem to settle down, um, or it completely fails. If you ever get one of those, and I get them a lot, then analytics integration will help you figure out what went wrong or what was causing this. If you don't have the integration, you won't have that. If you have a test that doesn't make sense, you know, everybody who's looked at it says, this page is better, I can't see why this old one is still winning, then again, you know, you can either just say, oh well, okay, um, we must be wrong then. <laughs> you know, it, it creates a feeling of uncertainty in you, not knowing what the answer is here. So if you don't integrate, you won't be able to find out. And if your test setup is broken, like you're actually, I had a test where people were uh, being assigned a cookie to, keep, to show them test A or test B, but the developers had made a mistake. The cookie got reset when they closed their browser. So what would happen is they would come to the site on Monday and they would see version A, and then they would come to the site on Tuesday and they would now see version B. Right, so of course my tests were shit, they're both about the same, because everybody was getting a random mixture of A and B every time they visited. So they should have stayed with A or stayed with B. I would not have found that problem in the setup if it hadn't been for the analytics data. The most important thing about all this is that averages lie. The average that you get, this average visitor gave us this much extra money. Well. It's like saying everybody has an average of, there's an average of 2.25 children in Sweden. Uh, nobody has 2.25 children. Um, so what is actually pushing those averages? What makes up the averages? What is the data inside the averages? If you don't have the integration, you won't see that. Vital stuff. Uh, and if you're using Visual Website Optimizer or Optimizely, uh, it's so easy to turn that on and make sure it's working. The important thing is, is that you set a custom variable to show the creative that has been shown to the customer. And you can, you can even run multiple tests like this. So if you have two EB tests running on your website, you can use your analytics data to tell you which combinations got the highest conversion. 
So it's it's almost like a multivariate test for AB. Very clever. But number four, number four, one common problem is people say, right, oh, we started our test. Well, how's it going? Well, it's kind of early yet. And then you say to them, well, how many conversions have you had? They say, well, we've kind of had three in A and three in B. And you say, how long has it been running? You say, well, oh, about three weeks now. And you just think in your head, wait a minute, this is going to take a fucking year to run this test, right? You know, we, we, the website will be different. The product will have moved on. Nobody has actually sat down to think that the test will finish sometime after you die. You know, so you've designed a great test, but you've not designed the test to suit the traffic levels in your site. So you almost need to design something around when do you want to get the result. If the answer is you would like to get it after a year, that's cool. If you've got plenty of time, feel free to waste everyone else's. But if you want your test in four or six weeks, you need to run the numbers. Um, I also love this photo because I really, really hate shit stock photography. <laughs> and this is a perfect example. Nobody fucking smiles at the screen like this. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen. No one's like, oh, it's so much fun. I'm smiling. You see it. You see it in phone adverts. You know, um, smartphone adverts. Everybody is like, you know, taking a photo. You know, looking at the phone, a message comes up. Nobody fucking does this in real life. It doesn't happen. It's more like, oh, the battery's gone. That's what happens in real life. Um, and so I, I had a little bit of fun with this slide. <laughs> Just a mess of it. <laughs> <laughs> totally cheated. <laughs> the way that you might be thinking about that one. No, that feels bad. If you want to work out how long your test is going to take, use this test length calculator. What you do is you put in number uh, the amount of traffic what lift you think you're going to get and it will tell you roughly reasonably speaking how long it's going to take you know so if the answer is going to be 8 months and you need to th rethink your test second problem leads on nicely from that one not testing for long enough okay so it's like oh we've been testing 3 days it's like 95% higher and then next week, they ask you about the test, and it's only 5% higher. And you look like an idiot. I have done this. I have, been, I have been encouraged out of it by feeling like an idiot several times. So I wait now before I start quoting things. And I don't show people graphs unless they actually understand them or it's run for long enough. So let me give you some nice, easy rules that you can use for your own test. First thing is, if you look in your analytics package, you will see a pattern like this. Yours, everybody's different, but you'll see this little bouncy pattern as traffic goes up and down. It might be over a day, it might be a cycle over a week. If you are a payday loan company, a short-term loan company, your business cycles are going to be over a month. So you're going to see these patterns. And what I call these is your minimum business cycle, your unit of business cycle. And you have to test at least two of these. You might have the biggest, highest traffic site in Sweden, and you think, yeah, we only need one week. But the problem is, if you run one week, and you forget to run the second week, what happens if week two is disastrous? You've, you haven't got any way of comparing two weekly sales or tests. So if you want to be sure that you're still getting the same behavior in week two that you were in week one, you need to test two cycles. So two minimum business cycles for most people, minimum two weeks. Right? Never test part ones. Don't go, oh, the figures are looking good, it's Wednesday, let's stop the test here. Right? You must test whole cycles. So if your business runs from Sunday to uh, the, the following Saturday, then test those cycles. Don't finish the test midway through because this will give you biased results. And don't stop when it's looking good. Right? It might be tempting to say, oh, it's looking so good now, let's just stop it here. It's really, it's, it's really tempting, but you've got to be good about your data here and have integrity. Don't try and cheat, because you're only fucking fooling yourself, not anyone else. Um, so be aware of multiple cycles. You know, you can have, it's a bit like when you're canoeing on the ocean. You know, you've got the little waves here, but you've also got the big waves underneath. So the Christmas season, holidays coming up, might be kids um, uh, going for school summer holidays. There may be some other bigger cycles, particularly around the marketing activity you're doing or the season of the year. 
So be aware of them. You may have these small cycles, but you might have big ones too. How long after that? Now, there's an interesting question. So I always aim for 95% confidence in a, in a test or higher. A lot of mine are much higher, 99%. But I aim for a minimum of 250 outcomes. So if you're doing an A-B test on a checkout, you need to get at least 250 people checked out on A and B before I really want to look at the data. And ideally 350 plus. Why these numbers? Well, it's not a precise pick. It's just that I know that if I aim for these numbers, then the other numbers should have fallen into place. It's a decent enough sample size. I should be seeing uh, you know, a separation between A and B by the time that I've got these, and this is a decent enough sample. However, it doesn't always hold true. But just bear in mind, if you're doing an A, B, C, D test, then now that means you're going to need 1,400 checkouts. So if you do an A, B, you're going to need 700 checkouts to happen. And if you know that you get, you know, 10 checkouts a day, that is going to be 70 days to get that. Uh, and so you can start to actually think, Maybe we should make this test shorter or put less in it because we want to get the result faster. But by doing this, you can actually work out how long, it's, uh, how long your units of testing are going to be. And this is very useful data in future. And you should have really worked this out before you start testing. If you've already started testing and then you've worked out that it's going to take too long, you've just wasted everyone's time. If you do any segmentation, so let's say, for example, you're doing high value and low value customers or new and returning or people who came via PPC or people who came via organic, if you're looking at the response in your test, you're going to need to double your data. So if you're looking at an A-B test, but you're also looking at you know, uh, PPC and organic customers inside those two, you're going to need 700 people, but then you're going to need to double that. So you're going to need 1,400 checkouts. You see, the more data points that you segment, the larger the data set that you actually need. Now, if there are any statisticians here or people who really know this stuff, you'll know that I'm glossing over a really, really important point here, which is if you test shit, it's almost the same, right? So it's a bit like testing the shade of color on a button, then it will take fucking forever for the two creatives to show any degree of separation. So if you test uh, split tests where they're very similar, it will probably take longer. You may need more than 350 checkouts in this example. So this is why you should always have bold tests because it actually shifts the behavior and means that your test actually shows a clear result earlier on. And so like I said, use a test length calculator, um, but the real important insider tip here is something that people don't often talk about much, which is those little plus minus things. You know where it says it's 8% or 10%, you know, plus minus something? Those plus minus things are really, really important because these numbers that we're talking about here are not precise numbers in space and time. They are like electrons going around an atom. They are fuzzy. We don't actually, they're not in a precise point in time. The best way of explaining this is, um, let me explain this using a tennis court. So let's say if we were calculating, it's kind of an A-B test, we want to find out who hits lowest over the net at a tennis match between uh, Nadal and Federer. Well, let's say we, we had the first set, and we start to collect the heights at where they hit the ball over the net. And we can see here that, you know, uh, Federer is getting the ball lower over the net and, and you know, we know that the, the average for where he puts the ball over the net is somewhere in here, but it could be here or it could be down here. It's probably most likely to be in the middle here, but it's not very much data yet. We're, we're not very precise here. So when you look at the numbers in your split test, you'll get things like, okay, it's 10% plus minus 1%. Well, that means it could be 10% or 11% or 9%. Okay, so it's very, very fuzzy. And this is true early on in a test. You don't have enough data to be able to say with precision where these are going to be. And this is because there's this thing called a bell curve here. So it's a bit like saying in the middle here, it's more likely it's going to be in the middle here, but it could equally be that the average is somewhere out here. But it's more likely to be in the middle. And that's what that 
that bell curve represents. So if we start to collect some more data, and <coughs> we've now collected two sets, you know, we can see here that Nadal started returning it lower himself over the net, putting more pressure on, and he wins the second set. So you've collected more data points, so your plus minus begins to shrink. This is the error rate, you know, it could be this, but it could be higher or it could be lower. And this error rate is really important because the more data you collect, the smaller those error bars will get. And that is because this curve is being shifted smaller the more data that you collect. So it looks like that now. And then if you go to the final set, you're, you've collected a lot more data, so your bell curve is applying over a much smaller space. And you, can, you can be very, very precise about where the average is. Let's, let's just look at this in a slightly different way. So when you have a test here that says this one is 10%, and this one converts to 8%, well, actually, you're just looking at the point on the graph. Actually, it could be anywhere along here. So these two are overlapping, right? So this one here that you think is winning, well, actually, it could be winning, but also it could be losing against the other one because this one could be out here and this one could be here. So what I look for in a test is when those error bars don't overlap anymore. The best way of... Um, the best way of showing that is when you ha when you start with your split test diagram, you will get you know eight percent plus minus two, okay, and then you will get your other result, which will be seven point five percent plus minus two. And what you can see here is that this is the point that's been put in my A/B test software, right? But actually, it could be anywhere along this line. Right? So I call these overlapping. So that means that this one could be beating this one, but equally this one could also be beating that one. You just don't know. You can't be sure. And when you get a split test where these two values separate cleanly like that, so they're like this, and there's no overlap between the two, then you can be much more confident that when the test software says this one is beating this one, then it really is beating it. And this is a common mistake that people make. They quote based on this point, but it's not a point of data. And the best way of looking at this is a fan. So when you start your test off, and you look at these nice little graphs of how creative A or creative B is doing, right? you're looking at a line like that right, on your graph, and you think, oh yeah, it's great, and this one's better than the other. But actually, this line is a region. Right, so this is the data point you're being shown on the graph, but it could be down as low as here, or it could be up as high as here. And the size of this fuzziness shrinks the more data that you collect. So if you were to draw two graphs, and these two fan areas were to overlap with each other, then it means that saying one is better than the other is not necessarily true. This is a really important point. I've, I've uh, uh, I've convinced Optimizely to do some work to put fan diagrams inside their testing solution now because what happens is people see the two lines and they just look until it looks good and then they say, we're done here, it's 25% left, it's amazing. But what they haven't realized is the numbers are not actually saying it's 25% left. They've just read it wrongly. So when you look at those graphs, just remember the error bars, it's a range is not a line. Very important point. So a summary of those, two business cycles minimum regardless of how many outcomes you get every day. Prefer at least 250 if not 350 in each part of the test. 95% confidence and watch those error bars. Um, really pay, pay some attention here to how much stuff you're trying to put in the test. If you make the test too long, it would probably be better to run four one-month tests rather than one four-month test because each test will follow on from the previous one. Um, you also got to be careful about the actual numbers that come to the test. You might make 10,000 checkouts a month, but if only 500 people see this page that's in the test, you're not going to shift that big number by much. And if you have test results where, where these overlapping areas stay like this for a long period of time, it just tells you you, you know, you've got a crap test. This is why you need to be brave in your testing. You need to make a difference, you know, even if it's a negative one, you've got to shift their behavior. 
And if you're not shifting the behaviour, then you're not going to see any difference in the numbers and you'll have an inconclusive test. So um, just pay attention to that kind of stuff and also when things suddenly change. I always say to people, in the first week or two of your test, uh, this isn't like you know leaving your kid with a, a nursery and sort of picking them up at the end of the day. You should be watching this like a chef cooking a dish. You should be tasting it, you should be watching it. Sometimes I'll watch an EB test 30 or 40 times in a day and I'm just going and looking at it. It gives me a real feel for wh what's going on but it also alerts me. I can start to see if suddenly things start to flip or change because I've been watching it very carefully for that whole period. I actually noticed that. You know, if I only looked at the test data once every two weeks during a test, then I would miss things like that. So uh, monitor <coughs> tests like a chef. Let me just get some water. Any, any questions? I, I don't have so much of a question, but I would like to So in conclusion, yeah. the the one thing that, that, that I think that, often, that you often forget is that when you look at, for example, 98% validity uh, or statistic, uh, statistical significance for a test, let's say that the test seems to be doing 10% better, and you have a 98% uh, statistical significance. The significance is for the test that it's, it's an improvement. The significance is not for the action number being 12%. The significance for the number being 12% is far much lower. So it says, it basically says that 98 times out of 100, this would be an improvement between zero and like a million percent. And the averages of all those is right now 12%. But the act, it means that if you're going to calculate that the chance that the improvement is between 5% and 20% uh, improvement, maybe that validity for that is you know, like 20% chance that it will fall within that range. So don't ever take your, it's fine that you're banking on a test saying that yes, we are certain we have a winner, so we're going to but we're going to uh, introduce that into the site. It's not 95 percent confidence. That that's exactly how much uh, lift you're going to get. Exactly. So you yeah. can take like 12 percent right. and then put it into your business plan because we've, we've proved that now we are going to have 12 percent more business in the next quarter because. Yeah. So don't obviously, the, the more that you've sampled the data, the more confident you can be that it's going to be around what you're seeing in the test. But there can be some things that affect we, that. We, we, did, we did a test of this, this test, for example, with um, uh, I think it was with Mount Bung when we did a when we did the test for uh, for uh, with this showing percentages of mm -hmm. um, and Kroner in terms of improvement. And then when we did a retest on that, the first test showed like a decrease of six and thirteen percent, and then the second test with the same variation showed a decrease of forty five percent and twenty five. So it's, it's a much higher decrease. And then somebody says that what there's something wrong with the test. And I'm just saying no. It's just it's the, the validity for an for for the change in positive yeah. or negative is still there. It's just that it's within this the statistical variation that the actual number. One of the things that I would really like to do is put together a, an online course for marketers and the the numbers, the stat stuff behind this. I think it's really important. Uh, I haven't been able to do this as part of today, but it's something that I'm going to do in future. So. <laughs> stay in touch, um, but I, I want to do it for free and just give it away to everybody. I think it's uh, it's the sort of thing you can say, D look, don't listen to me, just send it to your boss and say, read that, uh, and, and then we'll be good. You know, Scott, Scott Brinker from IN Interactive, uh, the chief market, he tweeted something like, uh, um, if, you, if you chose marketing in University because you didn't like the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> You've chosen the fucking wrong time to come onto planet Earth, then. That's all I can tell you. Because this, th this, this need for um, savviness about numbers and understanding how you're doing this stuff is only going to increase. Yeah. But anyway, and, uh, it's going to get more complicated. Um, here, here is a really, really important one. This is the biggest cause of fuck-ups that I've seen in tests. So I, I'm, I, I'm sometimes a test doctor. People bring me, it's like sick animals. They say, oh, it's, it's sick, please fix it. So they bring me things and I try and find out what's wrong with their tests. And in must be at least eight or nine tests this year. The reason that the test went the wrong way or it was screwed up because nobody bothered to fucking test it before it went live. What I mean here is I'm talking about browser testing in particular, but there's some other tests that I think you should run. Now, 
people say, oh, it's extra time to do this testing before you launch your test and you're in a hurry. But believe me, there's nothing as fucking bad as going two months on a test and then finding out that all that data is bullshit. Because you've got to do it all over again. It's like throwing up and then eating your own cold sick. <laughs> it's not nice. So please don't do it. It, it. it saves a lot of time in the long run, even though it doesn't feel like it. So these are, these are my top tools for uh, testing cross-browser compatibility. And tons of tests this year have browser problems in them. The problem comes about because you've got all these JavaScript libraries loading on your pages now. You've got the JavaScript for the test software. And all of these can all be working happily together, or they could be causing a bug in the browser. So I saw a big one last week with Internet Explorer 8. The reason that the test didn't work is because it was broken on Internet Explorer 8. It wasn't because the creator was bad. So if we'd gone back to the client and said, uh, our idea like totally sucks, it just doesn't work, then they're just going to think we're dicks. But what we did is we went back to them and said, yeah, we're total dicks. We messed the test <laughs> up, which was almost <laughs> as bad. <laughs> so it's a choice between whether they have confidence in you to do another test or no confidence in you whatsoever. It's not much of a choice. Um, if you, yeah. Sorry. Yes. I use Google Analytics. Um, there's a, whole, uh, a, a very simple methodology I've got for yanking a test list out of any site. Um, I have to write it up sometime, but basically that's the list that you give to your developers. The problem is everybody says, oh, do you test this stuff? And somebody will go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they like to test it. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Leave it with us. And then you actually go and watch over the shoulder and it's like, oh, we test it for a couple of minutes. It's just not good enough. Uh, I usually spend two, three hours um, doing Q QA testing on all split tests now. And do you know what? It saved my ass countless times. So you might be thinking back, see that test that I ran a few months ago that didn't work out? Maybe there was something wrong there. Certainly, if you look at the uh, conversion rates by browser in your split testing package, and if you've done your analytics integration as I suggested, then you will be able to see that some browsers are converting differently. But I wouldn't leave it till then, because then what you do is <coughs> the safety net is an analyst following up when your test goes wrong. Wrong approach. Get someone to do QA testing. I know a few good people who are really good at breaking things and get them to check this stuff before you go live with it. You will find bugs. Seriously. Uh, you will always find bugs in this sort of stuff. I have not had one test that didn't have at least one bug in it. So uh, it's well worth doing. So what QA <laughs> testing should you do? Well, Cross-browser testing, obviously. That's the most vital one. But uh, have you actually tested it from several locations? There might be some filtering in place, maybe to stop your office or the the call center or somebody else from biasing the test results. If everybody kind of comes and looks at a particular page as part of a test, but they're not actually real customers, they're going to bias that test. The other thing you should be checking is that the tags are firing correctly. A decent developer will be able to have a look at that. Somebody who looks after your Google Analytics will be able to help there. So you need to make sure that analytics and the test tool are firing all the stuff correctly. And, you know, at least do the whole thing of closing your browser and going back as a repeat visitor and seeing, do I get the same fucking test as I got last time? Because if you don't, then you've got a serious problem and you're just into the same fuck up that I had, which was people are randomly getting one of each of the tests. Um, and then, uh, you know, even if you're doing some, uh, once you've launched the test, be checking your figures in the test solution, but also in your analytics. If these two look completely different, like one seeing a 90% increase and one seeing a 10% increase, you've got a problem there and you need to figure out what it is. So having Google Analytics or another analytics package also recording what's happening in your split test as well as your split test package means you've got two sources of data to compare and it makes it much easier to actually find out what's wrong. And really monitor this stuff closely. But if you do two or three hours of QA testing, it will seriously improve the success rate of all your tests because they won't be broken. Simples. Number seven, um, opportunities are not prioritized. And this is, this is back to the, um, 
the plumbing again, uh, but it's also to do with the way that people handle their product cycles. So this is, this is a big one for me because you know once you've got a list of potential places to test, places that you know are broken, back to the kind of department store I was talking about earlier on, how do you prioritise which one you're going to do first? And there's an easy way to do this. You can certainly use the money uh, argument. So uh, you basically say we're going to run this test. It's going to cost this much time to build. So it's going to cost you know 80,000 kroner to build and five days of developer time. You basically looking at the opportunity. How much extra money you think it will make it? It, it will make you if it's successful. How much resource so development time or other people's time is it going to take to build? And then some other people also look at the time to market. Is it going to be ready in a week or is it going to take three months to build? And also, is there a big risk here? Is there a risk it could break something or prove to be particularly complex? But what people then do with this information typically is they create a quadrant diagram. So, you know, out of the 150 things that um, you, you've identified are worth optimizing and testing, you'll see clusters of them all over this diagram. But one of these quadrant di uh, this stuff here is going to be stuff that's really low effort uh, and really low reward. Over here, you've got really low effort and high reward, right? So I'm thinking, I'm just going to take all these high reward things and I'm going to do some of these and some of these. And those are the ones I'm going to concentrate on first because they're going to give me the fastest and best return on investment. So if you don't have a way of prioritizing all the stuff that you're changing in your website, I appreciate not everything falls into this model. But if you can't challenge things that you're doing on this basis, then why the fuck are you doing it? It's just like, oh, we're doing this. Why? Well, we think, uh, we think people will think it's cool. No, it's not good enough. Um, there needs to be a reason. Um, you know, Either it's because people have expressed the need for it, you've seen it in usability testing, the data tells you about it. But um, you know, you, you need to be prioritizing all this work that you do. Um, and this is a big problem when you come to look at clients' typical development cycles. This would be a lovely graph if all my clients had this. You know, but they, they're kind of thinking as well, we'll do some work on the product and then the new version will be coming out in six months' time if we're lucky. And then we'll get a rise in conversion, and then we'll develop another product, and then we'll get another rise, and it'll keep going like that. But it doesn't happen like this, because most of the time, what they don't realize is that all the stuff that created this lift, it was only two things out of 150 things that they changed that made that difference. So they, you had to wait six months for 98 bullshit things that didn't make any difference, and the two things that actually did make the difference. It's too long to wait. So as a Scottish guy, who, who uh, is always pained when he sees losing money. I, I like to think of it as bridging this line. This is the line that you want, of continuous improvement. So how can you get out of this sort of big, expensive product design life cycle? Because what you're missing is you're missing all the money that's coming in this yellow shaded area. That's money that's never going to come into your bank account. You're never going to get it back. But it is available for you if you really want it. So to get out that whole process of long development life cycles, you've got to really take an approach that, that's a lot leaner. And so you need to make sure that the stuff that's going out in the product isn't what management have decided. There should be a priority boarding card for anything that's an opportunity. You know, so if, if, if I'm a split test or something that's got the potential to make millions of pounds, then why am I not at the front of the development schedule? Why is this, this piece of crap that someone dreamed up a year ago that we kept pushing back that's going to make no money? Why is that now higher than something that could make millions of pounds? It's just crazy, but it happens all the time. So make sure the best seats are reserved for the things that are going to shift your metrics. And that's true of all your development efforts. And then release more often, you know. So you can get around this problem. People say, oh, we, we can't release like once a week. It's too much time to test and stuff. We'll hire more fucking testing resource because releasing more often will pay for the testing person because you'll get more money back. We're back to that yellow diagram again. If you're releasing you know, once every nine months or uh, releasing major product once every nine months or 12 months, you need to be releasing much more often. Most of the, the most successful companies that I've worked for, big or large, 
don't have release days. They don't have a time away, they release stuff onto the site whenever they want, whatever they want. They decide, they look at the risk, they say, hey, it's Friday, we don't really want to do it today. But they make that decision. There isn't some sort of process holding that up. They get stuff out whenever the business needs to. There's a big difference. Um, some people call this Kaizen, but it's a process of continuous improvement. And the most important thing that underpins all this is you don't just do split tests. You use a thing called the JFPI method. Just fucking do it. It's a really important method, this one. Um, but what it means simply is you make changes on your site to obviously broken things or things that need tidying up as well as running tests. And if you do these in combinations, it will get you that continuous improvement graph. So for the hair chain that I was working for, they said, we're not going to work on the new product for six months. Okay, so I said, why don't we change the existing product? And they said, how long it's going to take? So we said, uh, it's going to be a few days of development time, won't cost very much. How much do you think you'll get? So without making any functional changes at all to the booking process, rewriting the copy, improving the layout, fixing browser issues, nothing functionally was changed. We got 37% impro improvement in bookings. So we hadn't launched a new product, but the, what then happened was is the <coughs> mo extra money we made between doing that and when we started work on a new product was £360,000, right? Which is more fucking money than the new product is going to cost to build. So we made all the money to build the new product before we'd even started on the new product. And so that 10 days work, which didn't uh, cost, <coughs> probably total cost here was about £15,000 of putting this in, but it brought us back £360,000 in that time period. So it just goes to show you, people keep saying, put it in the next release. Oh, it can go in the next version of the product. Oh, we're too busy now. It can get left till later. Um, if you keep doing that, you'll keep missing out on stuff that you can have now. Uh, and it's the gift that gives every day. Increased conversion is going to keep paying you back every day. And the most important thing here is not to think about the cycles you've got now, but to make your own cycles and to design the way that you optimize stuff yourself. And the best example here is these guys, uh, the uh, British Olympic cycling team, they said, well, they didn't just go and get a new material for the frame and they say, we're done here. What they did is they tried to shave five grams or 10 grams off every single piece of the bike. The wheels, the chain, the cogs, the gears, absolutely every part of it, even the paint. Um, and if they go and find a thousand things like that, which take a tiny little percentage off the weight of the bike, then it means that they get a big reduction in the weight of the bike and they can win races and beat people. But it's very, very hard to find one split test that's going to, you know, it's going to last you for a whole year and everyone will think you're great and worship you. Actually, the person who's going to get that kind of adulation is the guy who changes 5,000 things in a year. Um, uh, but they all add up all those small percentages. Another common one, your, your test fails, it just comes out, it's lower than the other one. What do you do? You've got to go back and tell the client that it's failed. So what's going to be your explanation? You need to learn from the failure. If you can't learn from the failure, if the failure doesn't tell you something, so if your hypothesis is, if we do this, then you know it should make people feel this way, which should lead to them adding more to the basket. If that doesn't turn out to be true. Is the other side of that argument also useful and interesting to you? Next time you design a split test, imagine all the stuff going wrong. What are you going to do if the new version fails? What are you going to tell the client? So if you don't know or you're not sure what's going to happen there, get the test changed so that a negative actually becomes kind of useful. So even if something goes wrong, you know, it's not necessarily the end of the world. It should be telling you something useful about the test. But here's the important thing. If you have got that analytics integration, you can now segment. So you can find out not that the test failed, which groups of users caused the test to fail. And that's the useful data. One or more segments will be over or under. This is what happens when people run a split test or they redesign a website. 
there'll be the uh, let's say this is feature one on the new design or the new split test this one actually makes things worse and then this one makes things better that one makes it a little bit worse but what these do is these kind of cancel each other out this is the, the, the average problem that you get again so what you really want to do is find out things that are really driving behaviour up or really driving behaviour down and you have to segment to do that um, so no analytics integration you're not going to figure out anything useful from a test failure so every time this happens write up something about the test why did it fail? what do you <coughs> think was the reason for the failure? You know, what element do you think drove it? and if you know what went wrong like you made the price too big or you, you, you pushed something beneath the fold then you've got very useful information you've told yourself what it was that you did in the test that caused the failure and that's just as useful as getting great feedback on a successful test problem here is you just turn the handle the wrong way dust yourself down and get on with a new test um, my favourite one, the test is about the same you know where it's virtually no difference again you've got a big job here analyse your segmentation you know it may be that one test is doing better than the other but only on one segment of visitors and uh, it's really really important and if you don't find any difference at all even when you segment the data then it's basically it's just a shit test you've got to be bolder with your testing so if you find from split testing that there weren't really any differences between the segment seeing creative A and creative B then you just have failed to move them basically it's not actually doing anything for them and most of the time that's when people aren't bold or brave enough same issue is when the test fails dust yourself down and get testing again um, and the last one that I see not, not as often but it's still quite important is where the test keeps moving around so it doesn't seem to settle if you look at you know, an A-B test over time you'll see the data kind of solidify and that volatility at the early stages of the test where the data moves up and down a lot and then it starts to settle and then you kind of get solidity in the lines that's the sample getting bigger but there can be other reasons for this too so the reason that your test is still moving around can be because you just don't have enough data you know you still only got five or six people who've been through the process to the end so your sample size is simply too small or more common one guys in marketing haven't told you the split tester that they've switched something off oh yeah our PPC budget ran out the other day did we not tell you or yeah we just put this TV ad out last week and like I have spent so long trying to get people to tell me this stuff but actually it's futile because they don't always tell me when this is going to happen but if you see that test moving around and you see that kind of volatility look in the analytics because something has changed either the traffic has changed the actual market has changed uh, uh, your customers reaction to your offer you know or you've suddenly changed something in your marketing mix or your value proposition that's that, that's causing this to happen and the only other possible reason is, is that you have a completely volatile inbound marketing mix you, your marketing guys have got huge bags of amphetamines and basically spend all day changing stuff so much that they created a volatile kind of measurement scenario for you that happens very very rarely it's usually one of the first two things here so <coughs> if your test keeps moving around check the sample size go back to your marketing guys and check all the marketing activity calendar has anyone stopped anything or started anything and check the instrumentation of your test if you still can't find any reason look at the segmentation that's one answer for that one another one um, that I do see and uh, I got one of them last week where the, the test completely flips in the middle of the test so you're kind of going along and um, orange is winning but then suddenly on this day they swap places right and the blue one's at the top again what the hell has gone wrong here I just say the test has flipped on me you know it's completely flipped around from what I expected it to be if you've got a really mm. small sample size still if you still haven't reached your 250 or your 350 just ignore it it's the volatility of the test so just you should expect that don't worry about it too much but if the test has genuinely flipped and you 
already collected quite a big sample size, then some, something has changed. And uh, the one I remember from this is because your PPC budget ran out. Right? So they stopped sending PPC traffic to the site, which was highly qualified around a certain number of keywords, which meant that there weren't so many warm leads, which meant the conversion rate plummeted. And that really screwed that test. You know, so it's really important to figure that one out. Um, and again, like, there's one theme that's run through here. If the test doesn't work out for you, go back to the segmentation and the analytics data. There isn't going to be some other magic thing that you can run. You've got to go back to that. <coughs> so um, you won't be able to do any of this fixing stuff. All you'll be doing is you'll just be scratching your head wondering what the hell happened and why you wasted your time. <coughs> And this is the one talking to John's point earlier on. Nobody feels the test, right? So you run the test and you put these figures up on great big boards all around the office. 25%, right? That was your first mistake. You're promising something that may not actually flush through. So it's important to give the time uh, to see this data coming through once you've made the new creative live. So you promised a 25% rise in checkouts. And yet the guys who are monitoring the e-commerce side of the business say, well, we've, you put this live and we're only seeing 2%. Again, something could have changed with the traffic and advertising mix. What, what I did with, uh, with a few sites was I actually left. So I would run the test and A would be doing better than B. And we would be sort of chugging along here. And then on this day, I would put 100% of the traffic through to this version. So at this stage you get 100%. But wait a minute, what happens if I make that 90%, right? And I leave 10% running on the old version. Now let's say in next week the marketing landscape or activity changes and this version goes down, right, to 8%, right? Uh, uh, sorry, let's say it's conversion rate, of, it drops to a conversion rate of 8% and this one drops to a conversion rate of 10%, right? If you hadn't had this running, someone is just going to turn around to you and say, see that A-B test of yours, it's completely fucked our site. Like, we're getting less orders now after you guys made that live. But if you leave a bit of the old one running, you can say, well, actually, it would have dropped even more if we'd had the old one running. So what this does is it helps you prove, even if your test is running for a couple of weeks after and somebody's sees the figures moving and complains to you, you can go back with solid evidence and say, well, actually, I can prove to you the old creative would have been even worse than the one that we have right now. Very, very important point. Uh, it's a good way of getting people to shut up about that one. But the plain fact is, is that the test you ran six months ago is probably not giving you what you thought it would. And it certainly isn't probably giving you what you thought it would give you right now. So. You know, if you think, oh, hey, I ran a test in January, um, it was fantastic, it was great, uh, and so we must still be getting that lift today, right now, in December, the answer's probably not true, not unless you go back and retest it. And the only way to fix that is to do more testing. If you do four tests a year, you're fucked, because you, you're continually thinking you're getting all the lift off those tests, but you've not gone back to check you're still getting it. It might not be true. So always be trying a new test instead of basking in the glory of one you ran six months ago. You are only as good as your next test. Don't look back, look forward. And last but not least, and this one's just been a nightmare. See, when you do designing an AB test that's got to go on mobile, tablet, and desktop browsers, well, that's great. Everyone looks at it on the desktop side and says, right, we'll have a new headline and make a really long headline like this one. That's great. That's really powerful and persuasive. But see, when that headline now goes onto a mobile device, it's taken up most of the page. So you've just run an A-B test where you haven't looked at how it actually looks on customers' real devices. And the problem there is, if you're doing A-B testing on a responsive site, you've got to pay attention to all the viewports. So if your A-B test is changing the headline or a graphic, you've got to be aware of the fact that that headline and graphic are going to be looked at on a wide range of screen formats. And if you're not checking what those look like, you know, 
what you will find when you do check it is the content breaks differently, it looks differently, it'll change the meaning of it, it'll change how powerful, how much people can see of it. So use something like Bangle, which is a mobile analytics service, or Google Analytics to get yourself a test list, and make sure you're actually testing those devices. Now you can, uh, you can either get hold of physical devices, you can go and buy them, or you can use an open device lab. I'm not sure if there's one in Stockholm, but there's certainly two or three in London. Or there is a rental service called deviceanywhere.com where you can rent a mobile device that's sitting in a computer room somewhere. So actually this is just like if you want to rent an iPhone 4 in California, there is an iPhone 4 that you can remote control in the server room in California. So it's like having the real phone, you can install apps on it, send SMS messages, but I'm actually doing this all on a phone that's sitting in Silicon Valley in California. This service costs $40 an hour. Um, if you use it a lot, it's going to be cheaper if you just go out and buy unlocked handsets or, or, or get hold of the tablets. But the important thing is, what looks good on your desk is not necessarily going to look good on their screens. So that can really affect your test. So if you have a completely responsive client, you need to either make it a kind of desktop only test, but if you're doing a cross desktop mobile tablet, you need to be checking how it looks and you also need to be looking at the results in your analytics data. Um, and your personal phone that you have, this is not a QA test and this is not a representative of a device mix. Your personal phone is not the list that customers have, so just be careful. So, those are my top fuck ups for 2013. Uh, I hope that's given you a little bit of an idea about the main things that kind of go wrong here and maybe some ideas about how to avoid all the pain, anguish, embarrassing presentations to clients and scratching of head that mm. I've had over the last few years. And if it does anything, oh, sorry, I forgot I had this slide. I've got a bonus one here. Uh, here's an answer to a typical question asked by me. What is a good conversion rate? There's the answer. <laughs> That's the only answer worth explaining. Um, I hope that helps you go and kick some ass on your split testing results. And if you want this deck, I've already uploaded it to SlideShare. So please feel free to download it, steal it, use it any way you like, or email me afterwards. Thank you very much. I was thinking, uh, I didn't uh, discuss this with you, but it could have been a little booth here on the corner where now everyone can <laughs> vigil and say, like, uh, forgive me, Father Solomon, because I had the uh, skin and, and, and commit all the mistakes that you made, and then you can give them forgiveness. I would not yep. be the I would not be the priest in that situation, <laughs> but I have sinned more than you, my son. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, a lot. I made a lot of these mistakes early on in testing. I make less of them now, but we're we're still breaking things. So the QA testing is probably one of the biggest things for us here. Uh, if we hadn't been doing that, I think we would have had some really bad test results, or it would have led us to say, oh, this is great, right, we're going to spend more time testing this thing. And it would have completely set us on a, a total wild chase of something that didn't exist. So, yeah, it's, it's harder to do some tests before you go live, but that's the one thing I would say is save most money in anguish this year, testing things. What, what about you guys? What, which, one do you, which one do you commit to? Which, which <laughs> mistake have you made? Is there anyone who can feel that they did this, this or that particular mistake? So look, I'm not so much of a mistake, but battling that way you should have failed, but you haven't kind of failed conclusively. You just sort of get, you yeah. get very kind of spread metrics as you're looking at across the market, and you sort of like, really look positive here, or that segment, so, you know, looks positive, and you start looking at age group, and there's 